Okay, so I'm I'm uh, I've started the recording, and I will then share my screen. Okay, let me share my whole screen and share. I don't know what is happening. Let me okay. Okay, so please tell me. How will you tell me? That is also a question. Full screen. So let me know if you are uh, okay. So people can see it. Great. So uh, let me start. So this word cloud is basically the response that I received from the questions that I had. Uh, you know, I had put in the questions in the in the Google Doc, uh, Google form that you had all signed up for, in terms of what is. it that you would want to discuss so as you can see uh, you know pretty much everything is covered here people want to talk about portfolio stocks long term investing short term investing techno panda uh, interest rates valuations uh, etc etc so what i have thought uh, is that uh, uh, first of all uh, we will probably do this more frequently it's uh, when I, when i started the uh, advisory in 2019 we had done one i think sometime in october october november of 2019 and i had uh, the intention of continuing with it but somehow for some reason it did not sort of uh, uh, pan out that way and uh, so this is the second effort what what i've planned is that going forward we will probably have more of uh, these kinds of sessions where it's probably going to be a little bit more interactive and uh, uh, where we can share thoughts uh, where uh, you know all of us can learn together uh, i'm very happy that uh, there there must be a lot of you here who uh, been regulars at value picker and a lot of you who uh, sort of for the last maybe 10 years read uh, hitesh bhai's uh, you know posts and not many of you would have been uh, uh, lucky to have interacted with him or seen him and uh, i i have i consider myself lucky because uh, we've the uh, uh, the few people who we've you know sort of been together uh, through the value picker journey uh, you know we've learned a lot we've grown all together in terms of our knowledge in terms of sharing in terms of uh, the way we look at the investment world and uh, i think a lot of us have influenced each other uh i know for sure that uh, you know a lot of my uh, technical and techno funda stuff started from uh the walks that i used to take with uh, hitesh bhai when we used to go to the the goa annual meets so both of us are early risers and we used to go uh, to the beach and have maybe 45 minutes to an hour walk and we used to discuss and uh, then i i sort of figured out that you know here is this guy who's sort of using uh, technical analysis also and he's having fabulous results while using technical analysis and i had my blinkers on completely and i thought that people who use technical analysis are all uh, sort of fools and they were just looking at uh, squiggly charts and uh, slowly that realization dawned on me that that is not the right way of looking at it and you know it's better to have an open mind when you are investing and that is how i also started started my journey on that side then slowly uh you know once once you learn technicals you know, looked at indicators then slowly uh the thought process moved around uh, what is uh how to use uh, different types of indicators the quantitative side so all of those sort of uh, happened uh, slowly over the over the years so uh, that's been a very very good influence and and 
what that is also done for me personally is that it's kept my mind open to newer changes so when uh, when a lot of people uh, completely uh, disregard uh, bitcoins and nfts and things like that i still have an open mind uh, in in terms of the technology in terms of how the changes can uh, come up in the near future or even in uh, the next decade so that uh, you know the world is now changing it's in a flux and unless we are able to appreciate the change uh, it's going to be extremely difficult for us to uh, be able to participate uh, in that change so uh, with that i will so what the way we try to structure this uh, is i will have i have a very short presentation uh, then uh, i'll ask hitesh bhai to uh, speak a you know few words on Uh, what he likes about uh, you know the sectors and how to go about investing uh, and then we'll have uh, you know uh, interaction with you question and answers uh, you know stuff that uh, we can discuss and we'll try to sort of keep it at one and a half hours uh, at most because uh, then if, if beyond that i think people start uh, their attention spans uh, start to drop okay uh, so with that i wanted to very quickly take you through the mega trends for the next decade i i there were a lot of uh, requests in in the uh, webinar form to talk about mega trends and i i've written about this in the blog i'll just i thought i'll just share uh, you know some thoughts uh, and it might uh, be able to, you know you might be able to sort of connect the dots with that so the first you know big change and these are not changes that are you know for one year two years it's probably going to take you five years 10 years but once you are able to latch on to a particular mega trend or a combination of them uh then you one second there's somebody who has given some advice i let me figure out what that is uh Can you please click got it on the window which is open I am not sure what that means it is in the it is in the users window not your window I think the user has to click it okay 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 so yeah so first of all uh, the uh, okay before we uh, continue I think uh, the timing for this is probably not very suitable for people uh, uh, outside india and my apologies for that because uh, uh, as on date i think we have uh, investors from across the world i think the only continent practically where we don't have investors is antarctica and uh, so you all probably know that i am not very keen on uh, you know on a, on a policy on on discounts and things like that because i think that's sort of uh, unfair for other people who join at other points in time but if there is anybody uh, who wants to join from antarctica first year is free for all of them you just i just want to have a tick box that we have somebody in antarctica uh jokes apart uh, you know probably the next time onwards we'll try to keep the timings a little bit different so that people in uh, in uk us etc also are able to have a little bit uh, more convenient time to join the live sessions so we'll keep uh, changing the times and uh, i'm as you can see i'm recording the session so i'll put it also up on youtube and and we'll be sharing the links so uh, you know if you are in the us or if you are in a time zone where it's uh, right now uh, either very late or very early you can uh, you know you can continue obviously but if you want to drop off uh, please feel free to drop off at any point in time you will obviously have it uh, have the recording later okay so coming back to the presentation uh, so china uh, right now if you look at it from a economic political uh, you know angle and i and a lot of people say that uh, uh, politics uh, and social structures and social uh, you know challenges don't 
are not very relevant. I think that's complete nonsense because uh, politics is extremely important uh, uh, for the development of an economy, right? Uh, it, it's going to be extremely difficult uh, for any investor to make a lot of money in, say, Syria or in, uh, uh, in, in Mozambique or some place where there is political turmoil, right? Uh, it, to make uh, to make sustainable long term uh, wealth you need good strong uh, political uh, systems and governance uh, which is more or less stable uh, so understanding a little bit of what is happening in terms of uh, political strategy what is happening in terms of uh, social movements is also important so right now what i see is that there are two three things which is happening one is China is trying to become more and more dominant. China right now is the largest economy in the world in terms of uh, GDP. Uh, per capita, obviously, they are uh, they are below uh, a lot of countries. But uh, that's obviously going to be there. Similar to India, their denominator is high, population is high. So per capita will always be small. But uh, in terms of uh, sheer might of economic power, China is becoming more and more powerful and more and more assertive. And uh, being a neighbor of China, we will obviously always see that, uh, you know, we are more uh, sort of, uh, we've seen how things are playing out in the political uh, arena on our borders and things like that. And uh, my guess is that that is, these things are, uh, you know, likely to continue. Whenever there is a regime change, you know, it takes about 100, 200 years for an empire to rise and fall and you will see that that has happened previously in the past the british empire lasted for about 200 to 50 years uh, globally uh, before that you had uh, you know the the spanish dutch and much 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 before you had the roman empire uh, right now after the second world war you had pretty much uh, after the first world war in fact you had pretty much uh, 100 years of uh, uh, the British, uh, I mean the American uh, sort of uh, empire, if I may call it that, where uh, that particular country or region becomes the dominant force economically and militarily. Uh, my guess is over the next 10-20 uh, years, that shift or that uh, that power struggle is going to be very, very dominant between US and China. Both have their pros and cons. But uh, what is increasingly likely to happen is that there is going to be a polarization that is going to happen and we are already seeing things like that. Uh, China's uh, getting into Hong Kong. What is happening in Hong Kong very, very, uh, you know, under the radar is, and this is, you know, I get all my information typically from reading uh, uh, Financial Times or the Wall Street Journal. Uh, typically, uh, you know, what, what, uh, what I found is that there are a lot of global companies, MNCs, where the expat managers who were there in Hong Kong, they are slowly moving out and the company is not backfilling those positions. So slowly, and so that attrition is happening very, very slowly. It's not perceptible. So it's like the boiling frog syndrome, but it's going to uh, impact over the next four or five years that people are going to slowly move out of Hong Kong. Uh, so there is now a us versus them between US, parts of Western uh, Europe and uh, China. And uh, that is likely to uh, give rise to the China plus one that we are hearing all about. And doesn't mean that India is going to be an automatic beneficiary. But what it means is that there is definitely going to be a much more broader base of uh, supply chain uh, that is going to happen across the world. The other thing which is uh, relevant in this particular context is for the last 30, 40 years, we have seen a, a concerted effort towards globalization. Uh, my guess is for the last four or five years, we are seeing a movement away from that uh, of deglobalization, of centralization. And, uh, and that is happening across every country, whether you know they say it explicitly or not. In India, we are calling it Atmanir Varvarat. In in uh, US, uh, they have a name for it, uh, you know, uh, make in America, things like that. Every country, Eurozone, every country is trying to push that. And also, uh, you know, migration, 
people movement are becoming contentious issues uh, so these are things that we need to uh, look at and so the the bottom line of this particular trend is that you will see much more uh, of a broad basing of uh, manufacturing especially across the world uh, and a lot more of uh, decentralized lot more of localized uh, manufacturing in countries which is an opportunity which is a threat whichever way you look at it for businesses uh the next one is climate change now we hear every day uh, you know there are there is something about climate change in calcutta today we are in in you know sitting in january and it's it's cloudy it's uh, there's supposed to be rain in the next uh, couple of days and this year what we see, this year as in the last 6 months or the last one year we've seen continuous rains throughout the year i mean i don't remember any month where we have not had rains uh, when we were young uh, or when we were younger uh, we did not see this kind of uh, a phenomenon so obviously there there is something which is changing if you look at uh, weather patterns you will see that uh, you know or or natural disasters you will see that all of these are going up and what is also happening is that the more climate change comes into focus you will see a lot more of investments getting into companies who are working on different facets of climate change uh the biggest one that we see is you know we we look at uh, evs we look at uh, renewable energy a lot of uh, startups lot of companies who are working on those areas and but but the gamut of climate change is not only in evs or in uh, uh, you know renewables that is probably the larger piece of the cake but uh, climate change and related businesses are coming from uh, you know various industries so if you look at food agricultural land use uh, things are changing uh, you will find that uh, different modes of uh, cultivation of of uh, agri of uh, you know irrigation are coming up so lot of these things are uh, you know are, are going to get in uh, you will have a lot more of uh, carbon neutral uh, net zero these terminologies coming up more and more in the next few years in industry in manufacturing a uh, lot more focus on uh, environmental clearances for or for businesses uh focus on renewable energy not only at the grid level but also at individual uh you know domestic or 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 organization levels and obviously then there is a financial angle to it in terms of funding these uh, uh climate change related businesses whether they're part of esg or not so uh, you know you tag some business as esg and then automatically there is a lot more of liquidity flow which happens to those businesses etc etc so these are, you know this is another a very big change uh that we will see in the next 10 years and a lot lot of investments are going to happen a lot of uh, uh money is going to be made by businesses who are uh, going to be positively impacted or who are going to positively impact uh, uh this particular uh, area then the next one is uh, obviously technology everything is sort of uh, being run by technology these days uh, the fact that we are sitting here today on a you know webinar web conference uh, sitting at home last two years i think uh, we've all come to understand how uh, you know the level of uh, uh, impact technology has on our lives on our day to day lives simple things and on an industrial scale we you know we've seen uh, different industrial revolution we are at uh, the fourth generation of industrial revolution where we are seeing a a, a merging of digital where we are seeing merging of uh, analog all coming together for uh, for industrial manufacturing services to happen now the other trend that we are seeing with uh, technology is that everything is getting smarter 
uh, and I've written here except probably humans that was in jest. Interestingly, uh, I don't know if you've uh, read this, but uh, over the last hundred years, uh, human IQ has also gone up uh, by a few percentage points. Uh, that doesn't mean that we've become any smarter. Uh, we've probably become more stupid. Uh, but uh, purely in terms of uh, IQ uh, measurement, I think humans are also getting smarter. So now we're seeing, uh, you know, smart buildings, smart homes, uh, Web 3.0 decentralization, smart logistics, smart contracts. So all of these things uh, are going to happen. So again, all of these are going to be uh, sort of uh, uh, a, a combination of technology and uh, physical and real world processing. Technology today is touching everything. I don't think we need to, you know, emphasize this point. We are, you know, anywhere you look at, uh, you know, whether it's Internet of Things, whether, you know, cloud computing, uh, semantic web, where we are talking about, uh, you know, speech recognition, natural language processing. Uh, today, telemedicine has become very, very popular in the last two years, uh, you know, online con consultations, etc., etc. Uh, computer vision in terms of uh, uh, looking at facial recognition, uh, predicting uh, predictive analytics and technology is also getting into areas where it was not there previously, you know, in terms of where we never thought that technology would come in, uh, uh, not only as an enabler, but, uh, but as a core proposition. So something like a, as simple as food. So if you look at the entire food chain, technology is now getting into uh, right from uh, agriculture, right, cultivation of land to what you eat. So on one end you have uh, sensors being put into the soil which uh, is telling the farmer, you know, what sort of nutrients are required, when to water, uh, how much to water, etc, etc. To the other end where we are seeing uh, lab produced meat and things like that. Uh, uh, vegetarian meat, vegetarian fish, uh, those kinds of things. So, you know, technology is impacting everything around us. So that is the third mega trend. Now, uh, the fourth and the last one is obviously health and wellness. I think uh, this is becoming a trend uh, now. A uh, lot more people are uh, looking at uh, a higher lifespan and now the thought process uh, is beginning beca uh, you know beginning to move from lifespan to health span so if i am living longer i want to live longer in a healthy manner so what that means is you are going to see a revamp or a rethinking or a, or an intervention uh, at every touch point in the value chain whether it you know starting from uh, starting from uh, preventive uh, testing to uh, online pharmacies uh, hospitals primary healthcare centers uh, you know nutraceuticals uh, medicines wellness centers uh, so a lot of these things are becoming more and more integrated into the way you live uh, you, you will see that uh, you know companies like zomato investing in uh, a health startup right because everybody now wants to get into the uh, the health bandwagon i mean uh, since i bought a smartwatch i i keep you know maybe five times a day i start i i look at what my heart rate is uh, this is just the beginning, right? So tomorrow you will probably have an embedded chip uh, in your in your body somewhere, which will continuously monitor and then uh, update uh, some central system uh, saying that, you know, this guy is about to have this particular, uh, you know, either his sugar is going to go up or, you know, pressure is falling or X, Y, Z is happening. You know, this guy is going to have a heart attack or uh, this guy has fallen down and broken his leg. Uh, something like that. So all of these things are slowly, slowly beginning to happen. I think if you look at uh, AI and uh, if you look at diagnostics, a lot of, a uh, 
lot of uh, testing has been happening around uh, whether a computer can understand a MRI or an X-ray better than a human doctor. Now, uh, Hitesh Bhai is a doctor and he will probably not agree, but uh, nowadays the technology is uh, as so good that uh, it's, it's sort of clinically proven that uh, the, the computer is able to do it in a more better and systematic and structured format. Now, the interesting part in all of this is that uh, in each, in, in, in their, uh, in, in, uh, you know, standalone way, all of these are important mega trends. But once you combine some of them, so for example, if you have a tech intervention in uh, a healthcare company, or if you have a, a you know tech intervention in a climate change company, or you know wherever there is more than one, uh, there is going to be uh, you know sort of uh, incremental value that is get, going to get created. Uh, so whenever we are looking at any new business for the longer period, we should be uh, sort of having this at the back of our minds that where does this fit into these four frameworks in the longer term. So I'll give you a live example. So the last, uh, oh, uh, uh, you know, the recommendation that we had in the long term portfolio was uh, Cummins, right? So Cummins has a very big presence in the digital front in terms of uh, supporting data centers. But on the other hand, uh, its core business is of diesel generators, which is again impacting climate change. So unless, you know, that part moves into renewables uh, very quickly, these two are going to be in conflict, right? So when you are looking at a business like Cummins, you have to keep these two things in mind saying that at some point this will come and clash. So you need to plan for your exit if such a time, uh, if and when that happens. Whereas when you are looking at something like say, uh, uh, for example, a Tata power, or, you know, uh, or, or I mean, just that as an example, it, there, there could be a hundred other companies where, you know, you are looking at Tata power as a play on renewable energy you're looking at it also on the side of uh, maybe a digital tech because they are slowly getting into smarter homes and things like that. So again, in over the longer period, you would expect that a company like that will do, you know, reasonably well. Of course, there are other detriments to that company because it's in a regulated space, etc, etc. So the point I'm trying to make is whenever you're looking at a business for the long term, these are very important trends that you need to keep in mind. Okay, so this is uh, one uh, thought that I wanted to uh, share with you and I'll quickly uh, go through a couple, two, three more slides uh, uh, on the uh, situation that I see today. So one is that uh, if you look at emerging markets and when I talk about emerging markets, I'm primarily talking about uh, the bigger emerging markets like India, China, South Korea, Philippines, Brazil, Russia, uh, South Africa, etc. Now, uh, if you see in the last one decade, you know, last 10 years, uh, the US equities have, you know, sort of completely beaten uh, emerging markets, right? And, and that has been evident, right? We've seen uh, some of the large mega companies like Google, Facebook, uh, Apple create uh, humongous amounts of wealth in the last 10 years. But if you go back in time, go back 10 years uh, further and look at, uh, you know, 2000 to 2010, 11, that period, you will see the exact uh, mirror opposite of what happened then, right? Emerging markets actually completely beat the US equities. And, uh, that was a time when emerging markets were growing very, very fast and, and uh, you had acronyms like BRICS and things like that. Uh, my sense, and I uh, I have nothing to, because obviously there's nothing to prove because this is just, uh, you know, we are talking about the next uh, decade. My sense is that we are in, in for a, another run of emerging markets over the next 10, 12 years. Uh, 
what has been interesting is if you look at the emerging uh, markets basket right you will see that whenever there has been a big uh, you know market crash or when the when the economy has uh, sort of uh, fallen off the cliff india has actually performed really really well uh, compared to nearly all other uh, emerging markets and definitely with respect to the larger emerging markets so uh so typically i mean poland is not a competitor to india right i mean in terms of uh, equity flows in terms of business flows india typically fights against china south korea uh malaysia south africa uh, then philippines thailand is probably a little bit smaller russia brazil has fallen off the cliff uh pretty much uh, in the last decade so what you've seen is that uh, and this is corporate uh, earnings right so what we've seen is when markets fall off the cliff uh indian you know companies corporate earnings remain reasonably stable uh we have a working democracy with reasonably uh, okay institutions so i don't i i i see that uh, you know liquidity flow into india is likely to continue we will uh, not see a huge amount of money that is going to you know go out in a hurry uh, which is typically the uh, the fear that a lot of people have when interest rates start rising uh, especially in the developed world okay i think that is what i wanted to quickly share and uh, then i'll uh, move over to hitesh bhai hitesh bhai uh, can you unmute yourself and i will uh, move over to you <laughs> ha huh. so uh, whenever you have want me to move to the next slide tell me i'll, I'll move to the next slide yeah so good morning everyone nice to be interacting with all of you i think for the first time along with abhishek so he has talked a lot about the macro thing and the global part of things and all i'm more focused on uh, uh, stock sectors basically where the money is to be made so th that has always been my focus i'm not too too good at macros and so that's something that i don't want to get into too much because over a long period of time i have seen most of the macro guys have got most of the things wrong and whenever they get it right they get a right to trumpet it for long period of time till till they get wrong again so that's how things pan out so coming to the market outlook for 2022 which abhishek told me was the main theme of our talk uh, today so even a cursory look at the market will tell us that the next maybe 6-12 months, 15 months are going to be slightly difficult in terms of ease of making money. So all the low hanging fruits I think have been taken off. Most of the stocks, even garbage stocks have gone up 2-3-5 times. So beyond that, it requires a lot of effort and stock picking skills to be able to make decent money. And the other thing is as investors we need to temper our expectations that Say we are not going to get a hundred percent portfolio returns over a year. Maybe even if you get through unscathed, if you if you uh, take care of preserving your capital, also it might be a good job. Who knows? But that is how we have to position ourselves accordingly, and then try to think of our our investments. Because if we continue in the same vein where you are expecting stocks to run up like crazy every time. you buy those things then you are in for some disappointment going forward that is at least my view so previously see what used to happen was markets used to correct 5 7 8 percent from the tops and immediately those levels used to be regained very quickly now here we have a situation where in october we made a high of 18600 and it's almost now 3 months and we are yet to regain those levels 
so that that tells us that markets are finding it difficult to scale the previous peaks and we are in for slightly prolonged consolidation so there will be a range which probably will be established maybe on the downside and on the upside and will continue to swing between those boundaries the the good thing about these things it is that there will be a lot of stocks to be picked up and lot of stocks that would still turn out to be winners not in the same percentage winners as we had earlier say earlier you pick 10 stocks and 6 7 8 of them turned out to be winners now it may be two or three of them will do well the rest of them might remain static that kind of thing so that is where your stock picking skills will come into play and that is where we have to focus so uh, Basically, the plan for Technofunda guys is to be on their toes, book out wherever they find that uh, runoff has happened and you've got enough of returns to satisfy you. You should at least book partial profits or maybe get out totally whatever you're comfortable with. Or the longer term guys, the SIP all fall kind of guys will, will have a field day because they will have plenty of opportunities to keep adding to the stock picks. Uh, I'm not too sure that approach is going to work very well because I, 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 I'm there in a lot of other WhatsApp groups and people are still carried away by the old winners. And going ahead, I don't know whether they are still going to remain winners going ahead also or not. Uh, every decade has, it own, has its own set of winners. And you have to be able to figure out where you should position yourself to make decent amount of money. So, so that is the crux of the message for the next maybe 12, 16 months, 18 months kind of time frame. So next slide, Abhishek. So in the near to medium term, we can clearly see where the fancy is there. Even the, the stock prices are telling you those things. It should not be difficult for somebody observing the markets to look at these sectors. So those are, I have listed them, power, capital goods, capex related themes, real estate, EV plays, some chemical companies, some textile companies, sectoral uh, fancies are there at present in say textile, those kind of business. So th this Cyclical sectors will keep changing, say at some point of time you might get paper or you might get uh, vehicle tires kind of thing. So there you have to keep on keep watching things, how things are panning out. Our effort will be there to focus on these things because it's our job to do that. So in the immediate, see, I, I'll just give you an example how to go about this thing. Yesterday or maybe day before tomorrow, the, the results of Max Ventures were out. Now, Max Ventures is a company which has got two divisions. One is real estate, the other is polyfilms. So if you look at the segmental results of Max Ventures, it is there in the uh, result also. So the standout numbers are from polyfilm division. It is absolutely a blowout quarter for the polyfilms. Now that should tell you a thing or two. There's not much differentiating, differentiating point between all these polyfilm companies. They, they tend to declare results as a sector. The stock run-ups in different stocks might be different, but the results you can easily guess where it's going to be. So all these polyfilms probably might be the next sector to catch market fancy because all of them are likely to report very good numbers going forward. That is how you should look at things and try to correlate the uh, earnings and try to connect the dots. And those are the companies which are not going to fall too much during market falls also. So that is another signal we should be watching out for. The other thing is try to find out companies with consistent earnings, good management commentary, and then be invested in those companies and that should do the job for you. So next slide. So <clears throat> this is what I was talking about, that we have to temper our expectations going ahead, low hanging fruit have been taken out. So stock picks has to be the way to go forward. Uh, next please. So another thing I have observed recently is that uh, 
if you are too much concentrated say many times i take myself to exorbitant levels of concentration where <laughs> i hold only 5 7 8 stocks and there is often that frustration where sectoral fancies change very often for one month one and a half months you got real estate then you got textiles then you got something else and then something else and you feel that you are missing out a lot on the rallies happening in a variety of stocks and you often can see those things happening but since you don't want to give up your concentrated position you often tend to miss out on these things so there you might want to relax your stance and probably be slightly more diversified in order to capture uh, more upside say uh, in stocks that you select and at a portfolio level ultimately so this has been an observation of late this doesn't hold good always but it is for somebody who is able to vary his investment styles according to the market situation many people are very happy say i know ayush mittal is very happy with a very diversified portfolio he is, he is almost i can i can call him almost a peter lynch lynch used to hold 1400 stocks at one point of time ayush i think must be holding 80 to 100 kind of thing so for me it's an nightmare to even think about such situation but there are people who are happy with that but we have to draw our boundary say i can go up to 15 stocks somebody else can go up to 30 stocks It's up to you so that is one learning i have had in last couple of months and uh, the other thing is winners tend to keep on going up that is what we have seen in these markets uh, even in our peaks you must have seen stocks like say shobha and all these things they, they keep going up after a brief period of consolidation they tend to go up so makes sense to keep riding them if at all if you if you are too jittery or if you are if your uh, allocation level increases drastically then maybe you might take some money off the table but keep riding the major position that that has to be the take home message from this next slide ho gaya so this is briefly what i wanted to talk to you about and more i think we will be discussing one on one whenever